Okay, after that little delayed start, hi everyone. Um, sorry about that, we had some um, technical issues with showing out the link um, and all at the same time. What's up with now? So we didn't realize. Anyway, we're here now. Um, so yeah, welcome everyone to our third webinar this week, organized in response to the police crackdown bill. Um, I'm Hajara from Abolitions Futures and I'll be facilitating today's session. It's been so engaging to see so many of you consistently join. Um, and I was really moved uh, yesterday when we saw over two and a half thousand people join Sister and Cuts organizing meeting as well. It just goes to show that our movement is strong um, and it's been effective. The bill has been delayed, um, it's been pushed back to the summer and it's just, just another proof that um, there's power in an organized movement. However, of course, it doesn't end there. In our first session on Wednesday, um, Assad talked about the longevity of the fight and how Kill the Bill was used against other draconian, um, draconian bills um, many years ago. Um, and on, in last night's session, we talked about the hate crime um, and how it's being added to the domestic violence bill and how these carceral solutions are not confined in just this one bill. So we must, of course, continue to organize um, until we've killed this bill, but we have to continue organizing well beyond that um, until we've built a world that we can all thrive, thrive in. So in today's webinar, we're gonna be focusing on just that. Um, it's titled Building the Movement to Meet This Moment. Our speakers will offer practical advice and share the experiences of mobilizing, building momentum and driving through a movement. I encourage you to use the Q&A box if you have any questions um, and we'll get to those hopefully towards the end. Um, if you do add any comments, please feel free to use the chat, but um, if you have questions, please do Q&A so we can get to them. So today we're joined by phenomenal activists. Um, I'll just introduce them very briefly. We have Kevin, who was one of the founding members of the Network for Police Monitoring, NEPOL, which monitors violent, excessive and discriminatory policing in Britain. We're also joined by Zahra, who's an educator who organizes with No More Exclusions. Also Becca, who is a researcher focused on mental health diagnosis in UK prisons, and she also organizes as a creative campaigner with groups such as um, Fuck Forest. Um, and we have Emmanuel, who is a university student, a writer, and also a, a campaigns manager for Hackney Account, which empowers young people to campaign for justice. Um, and last but not least, um, we're gonna start with Gracie, who is a, the interim director for Liberty. Gracie is a policy expert, writer, and campaigner with expertise in civil liberties, state racism, and surveillance. Now, unfortunately, Gracie does have to leave um, after her intro, um, but for now, over to you, Gracie. Thanks so much, um, and thanks so much to Abolitionist Futures um, for organizing this really amazing series of events. Um, so yeah, as I said, I'm gonna speak as someone who's had a foot in activism for a long time and has also spent seven years doing policy and campaigning work in NGOs. And the mobilizations we've seen over the last few days, so for me, the stuff of dreams and really all credit to Sisters Uncut and to everyone who's mobilized online and offline because lobbying doesn't really mean anything without a movement behind it. Um, when it comes to the dark art of influencing legislation, it's always possible, possible to get technical tweaks. You can take the edges off things and you can sometimes win changes that are meaningful to people. That's mainly the case when the government majority is much smaller than it currently is or when discipline within the governing party is much worse. Um, but it's pretty rare that you get really significant changes by the time you're at the point of draft legislation with a government majority this big. And you more or, ne you more or less never see a vote against legislation at second reading. It's a matter of convention, convention and that the Labour front bench did so is a testament to everyone who's mobilized online and offline against this bill. Um, and the bill reads as an existential threat to the right to protest. But even if the bill is passed, that's not a threat that's going to be realized because as the events of the last week show, people are going to protest anyway, because protest is a right, um, it's not a gift from the state. But the bill will create more opportunities for the police and the Home Secretary to crack down on protesters, leading more scenes like those that we saw in Clapham last weekend, and which we've seen in response to many other protests during the pandemic, and of course, before the pandemic. 
The bill is also a really callous attack on gypsy Roma and traveller communities. It's going to magnify the injustices already faced by predominantly young black men in their interactions with the police. And the bill will see so many more people imprisoned when we know that England and Wales already imprison the most people per capita in Western Europe. And I think really the vision of community safety that this bill proposes is carceral, it's discriminatory, and it's just completely inadequate. Um, and this is all part of a wider government war on accountability that's currently taking aim at voting rights, judicial review, the Human Rights Act and more. So, as I say, I've spent the last seven years doing policy and campaigns work. And as you know, Liberty works with politicians of every party. And politicians listen to the media, they listen to sustained public pressure, and crucially, they listen to their consti constituents. And it will take all three to keep the Labour front bench grouped around amendments to get rid of the worst excesses of this bill and to bring Conservative backbenchers on side. But as I say, legislation is the tail end of a very long process of public conversation and policy making. And if we really want to win in the long run, we need to get out of defensive mode so that our demands for rights and freedom set the agenda. Otherwise we get stuck with a pretty useless debate that, is, that hinges on something or nothing. And I think that that's exactly what the conversation around the government response to the pandemic has exemplified. We've got politicians voting on the Coronavirus Act next week, um, and it's to avoid that false dilemma of something or nothing that Liberty, we drafted our own alternative Coronavirus Act. I also think that Netpol's Charter for Freedom of Assembly Rights is another amazing initiative that gets out ahead of the gradual chipping away of our freedoms that we're facing on so many fronts. So, as I said, changing legislation takes a movement, but movements need to do way more than that. Movements can't only be defensive. Um, we have to build towards the change we actually want to see in the world. And I don't think there's one right way to do this. Um, there's lessons that we can learn from the decades of amazing activists and people that have gone before us, but it's something that we do all have to figure out together as we go. And as I say, unfortunately, I have to skip off in a minute, but I can't think of a better group or a more committed group of people to be figuring that out together than the organizers who've joined the webinars this week and especially those that are here this evening. Um, so thanks a lot for having me. And as I say, all power to you. Thank you so much, Gracie. Um, that was such a helpful summary of just how dangerous this bill is, but also how much power we have as a movement to apply that pressure that Gracie talked about. Um, yeah, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us, um, even though you're so busy today. Um, okay, so next um, I'm going to ask Kevin to do his intro. Yeah, hi. So I'm glad to be here because my computer, computer crashed just before this meeting, which was terrible. Um, so two issues here. Firstly, on the policing bill. Gracie's absolutely right. We're obviously going to need a diversity of tactics. This isn't one of those occasions where we have everybody under one banner with one joint statement. Some people are going to focus on the passage of the bill. Some people are going to focus on the individual element, elements within it. Others, like Netpol, are going to focus on the architects of the bill, the senior officers who lobbied for it. There are obvious overlaps in all this. We plan to make um, a submission to the Joint Committee on Human Rights because it's an opportunity to talk about the experience of some of the political and social movements that we've worked with over the last decade. Um, I'm, I'm not exactly sure how I feel about calls for amendments to the bill. I think the bill needs to be opposed in its entirety, but that's much more about um, where our energies are put rather than necessarily about criticising uh, other organisations for the strategies that they tend to adopt. I watched the the this the webinar on, on Wednesday and my old friend Asad Maman was on there and one thing he said was absolutely right, we need to slow this down. Now clearly um, the decision that's been taken to push back the next stage of the bill is a, is a victory, um, but sustaining the pressure that, that over the last exhausting week is going to take reflection and it's going to take organisation. Ultimately, we need to get back on the streets and outside of Parliament, preferably in a show of force. Uh, if not before, we definitely need to do that by the, by the 17th of May when lockdown restrictions start to ease. So turning to the wider debate about building a movement towards abolition of the police. Um, I've read a lot of excellent analysis on abolitionist ideas, but we need to be aware of the challenges that we face in winning people over. 
There was a poll this week that showed that 50% of women and 56% of men supported the crackdown that took place at, um, at Clapham Common in what was, I have to say, that still represents a disaster for the police in terms of their ability to be able to offer policing by consent. But I'm sure that I'm not the only one here for whom 100% of the people that, that we know felt that this was an absolute outrage. So who are these 56 and 50%? They are part of that larger majority, the much larger majority than 50%, who broadly believe that the police, the thin blue line, are necessary. I spent 25 years as one of a number of volunteer activists for a group in East London called the New Monitoring Project. And we were campaigning against racist, um, racist violence and police harassment. Um, and I'm, I know that there's an ambiguity about the, the police in communities targeted by oppressive policing. On the one hand, there's real deep anger about racist policing, but on the other hand, there's this deep frustration that the police treat working class and black communities like second class citizens when they are themselves the victims of crime. Much of, uh, of New Monitoring Project's work on racist violence was about making demands on state institutions to investigate those crimes. Now, New Monitoring Project was one of the founding members of the organisation that I'm now one of the coordinators of, that's NetPol. And today, NetPol has been organising a day of action demanding that uh, the National Police Chiefs Council stops lobbying for new powers to crack down on protests and stops ignoring our human rights. And we've been criticised for that. I mean, I've, I've had messages saying, why are you making demands on the police? We should be arguing to defund the police. And my response to that is simple. Um, simply stating that, that, we, that we need to defund the police with the right amount of enthusiasm and swagger isn't going to get us there. Uh, isn't going to stop the pressure for, on people to settle for more bullshit reformist ideas like bias training or dialogue policing. Um, so as well as theorising about abolitionism, we need to start ramping up our organising. Um, in his book, To Die for the People, uh, a book I really recommend people read, Huey P. Newton, one of the founders of the Black Panther Party, talked about local programmes, and I looked up the quote for this today, that satisfy the deep needs of the community but are not solutions to our problem. This is why we call them survival programmes, meaning survival pending revolution. Newton said that those programmes are not the answers or the solutions, but they help us to organise the community around a true analysis and understanding of their situation. Right now, there are good organisations who are already working around what you might call broadly abolitionist work, but that idea of survival programmes is, is one of the reasons why over the last six or seven months, I keep banging on about the importance of one idea, and that's starting local police monitoring groups. Get your hands dirty with casework that is, is supporting people who are faced with the misuse of stop and search, who are faced with police racism, um, anti-working class attitudes towards gender, gender and racial violence. Um, and as, as Newton said, the process of doing that, of organising a true analysis and understanding of the situation in our communities will come from the campaigning work that emerges from that casework. That's that was absolutely our experience when I was uh, when I was involved in your monitoring project. This is how we start to test out, re reject some, but adopt different tactics that are going to change the debate about policing in Britain. Um, I've said before, we don't have a transitional program to get us to to the abolition of the police. But for me, that is one idea that's worth trying out, and it's one way that we can make a start. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kevin. Um, yeah, so um, it's, I think it's really interesting to hear about what are the practical ways that people can start organizing and police monitoring um, groups is just one example of those. So um, hopefully we can hear more about that later on. Um, and if there are any resources on how people can get started, um, please do share those as well. We are also quite lucky to be joined maybe not yet but um i'll introduce them i'll introduce them when they come on um okay so passing on next to zahra um zahra do you want to go would you be keeping your video off okay is my audio okay you can hear me somebody send me a sign when it goes because it's really erratic 
Okay, so thank you very much for inviting me. Good evening to everyone. Really happy to see the other panelists. Um, and, you know, more power to everyone that is coming to an organizing, to me, this is an organizing meeting uh, on a Friday evening. Um, so yesterday, Sister Sanka, um meeting i don't know how many people that are attending this one were there but it felt like a turning point to some of us there was something new and different about it um and although we've been here at this you know at this kind of landmarks moment where we kind of feel something substantial could change right and then and then the mark kind of moves uh we've been here before i i we feel like the in spite of the really difficult week, a two weeks, year that we've had, um, we potentially, as organizers, we are at a turning moment um, and we really need to pull together on it across organizations, collectives, um, groups, and so on. Um, I'll just say a couple of words, Najira, if it's okay, about NME in case people are not familiar with the collective that I'm representing. So, so no more exclusions is her. Uh, grassroots abolitionist, um, uh, I guess, movement um, that got together at the end of 2018. Um, it was started off by uh, people like me, uh, educators, um, but also parents, young people, um, there's some academics, there's, there's educational psychologists, social workers, people that kind of work across the spectrum in education um, that are interested in the disruption of the school to prison pipeline. Um, I know there are, there are people like Kevin that works at the police end, there are people you know, that work at the prison end, um, but we find that we thought that there aren't many people yet, we hope that, that that will grow, that are working at the school end of the pipeline, at the school end, right? Uh, of how uh, talking about, Kevin was talking about working class and racialized young people are funneled through um, mercilessly, really. And for generations, um, um, these, these multiple systems of oppression. Um, in, in, in essence, in short. Um, as teachers, because <laughs> often people say, well, no more exclusions haven't got a clue what it's like to be in the classroom. They don't know how hard it is to be a teacher. Uh, yes, we do. Uh, myself, I've been a I was a teacher, still a teacher. Once a teacher, always a teacher uh, for 20 years. Uh, half in secondary mainstream and the other half in a pupil referral unit, uh, alternative provision, which... I'm um, sorry, a lot of people uh, will know, and maybe others don't know, is where young people and children who have been excluded, as young as four, by the way, as young as four and five, you can be excluded, permanently excluded from school in this country, um, uh, come to, to those kind of settings. And, um, and I really thought um, in those kind of spaces that you know we can make a difference, talk about reforming, right? Reforming the individual and, and the change that the child, the young person can do and so on. I think it, it's only, and, and this is a big regret as an educator, is only, as in this is why education is so important, is only as a result of sustained study, looking at critical race theory, black, black radical theory, black feminism, um, that that really came to grips with, um, I suppose, how I how I have been complicit as an educator in that system, how I have contributed to upholding it. And it is quite a painful realization, um, but I think it's really necessary in this process of becoming an abolitionist that we all kind of start from a place of self uh, reflexivity. Um, and we kind of look at not, not just our privilege, you know, there's a lot of talk of examining your privilege. Yes, we must do that. But also we must look at where are we positioned within these systems, not just because um, of how we contribute or important that is, but also because of the way we could influence those systems from the inside. Um, in terms of, uh, Kevin was talking about the, you know, setting up uh, monitoring, mo lo local monitoring groups. So enemy organizers in local chapters. And right now we have one in Manchester, one in Birmingham, one in Bristol, um, and we'll hope that there will be more. And what, what we try to do is multi-pronged. So there is a lobbying element to the work 
there is a uh, organizing element to the work, which is seven days a week, round the clock, sometimes it feels. And then, and then I, I guess we haven't done much direct action yet, but it is certainly something that we would like to do. And this bill, of course, threatens that aspect of the work that we have been planning to do. Um, I guess amongst the organizers that are here tonight, and it may, maybe one of the youngest, maybe one of the baby movements. Um, so I would urge, you know, Kevin and Abolitionist Futures and everybody else that's 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 uh, been around for a while um, to kind of, you know, extend the wisdom of the things you've learned. Uh, how do we keep ourselves safe? Um, yesterday, uh, those of you who were at the Sisters Uncut uh, meeting will know that I read out a statement. I'm not a member of Sisters Uncut, but I opened the meeting by reading a statement on behalf of Sisters Uncut because of safety and security uh, concerns, right? I think we really need to think about how do we keep each other safe, um, both online and offline? How do we do community care? How do we take time out? How are we encouraging each other to sleep? How, uh, these are very basic things. I know it sounds very basic, but I think as organizers, uh, from my experience, um, we often take care of everyone else but ourselves. And, and I think that is a real huge threat to the movement. If we're not well, if we're not um, able to, to um, look after our own garden, it's really unlikely we'll be able to look after other people and the movement. So those are my kind of messages, my kind of key messages. Um, if people want to get involved, I'll drop some links in the chat, if that's okay. Um, and I'm going to stop then. And just solidarity to everyone. Um, it always, it's always darker before dawn. So we're just going to keep going. Thank you. Thank you, Zahra. Um, yeah, that was so powerful. And that's the thing with No Monk's Fusion, you talked about the whole from school to that whole system, you know, and I think many of us who are racialized and come from working class communities, I'm sure we all have family members or maybe ourselves who have gone through that and we know how difficult it is, the endless attentions, the endless, you're, you're the trouble kid and how hard it is to change that image. So I'm forever grateful for the work that um, you guys are doing, even though you are a baby, <laughs> a baby organization. Um, and of course you talked about the very powerful um, messages of how we can think about the positions that we have and then also look after each other as a movement. So again, I hope we can, in the discussions, kind of share some of those knowledges um, with each other. Um, next, I am going to ask if, um, yeah, Becca, if you wanna um, introduce yourself and get going. Hi, hey, thanks so much everyone for coming this evening and thank you to Abolitionist Futures for having me. Um, I really wanna talk about something quite specific today. Uh, we've heard both uh, from Gracie about lobbying, from Kevin, and also from Zahra about what uh, organising looks like in a long time way. But I just want to talk about something specific, which is mobilising, um, mobilising for actions and for demonstrations, because we've seen the way in which really quickly pulled together sustained forms of protest can shift massively the public conversation on this bill specifically, and can also shift the way in which, as Gracie has talked about, politicians and parties are approaching it. So really, I just wanna say mobilization is for everybody. Um, this is not something that is beyond you because you're not a professional activist or you don't have years of experience or you don't work in some kind of social or community NGO. You're not a 24 seven rabble rouser. It's not something you identify with. None of that matters. Every single one of us can contribute to create and grow these kind of mobilizations in our community where we are and if we're going to beat this bill and if we're going to uh, continue to survive and win things under this government we have to it's imperative that we all make those kind of contributions so i'm speaking today kind of about a case study i guess that i was involved in which was the fuck boris campaign um because this is really what we did we were an unfunded group of mates essentially who when it became clear that Boris Johnson was going to become our prime minister, we knew that we could not let that day pass without at the very least uh, some kind of marking of the fact that there was widespread disapproval of his becoming prime minister of this country. 
Uh, and so in three weeks, with no money, we fundraised, uh, we built demonstrations, we produced, you know, the social media and press aspects of it and did the communications work as well. We reached out to a broad range of organisations to be co-hosts for our event. We spoke to them about the kind of issues that they wanted to make sure were represented in our demonstration. We got a double decker bus and a sound system because we were going a bit overboard at that point and we wanted it to be a festival we wanted it to be a celebratory day it was the middle of summer um, and it had a bit of a carnival vibe to it as well um, and within three weeks we managed to turn around a demonstration of over 7,000 people um, to meet Boris as he walked into 10 Downing Street and indeed we actually stopped the transport secretary Grant Shapps for going into Downing Street and getting his job that day getting assigned his new role because we were filling the streets outside of Downing Street and really I tell that story just because we weren't professionals this was pulled together by scrappy women the majority of people in Fuck Boris are women of colour we thought about key questions that we wanted to do with this action what kind of a role would this action serve and how could we put it together with the resources we had the people that we knew and then we did it uh, and following on from that initial demonstration we actually then over the course of the 2019 election managed to support groups across the country to run 45 different fuck boris events some of those were parades and demonstrations of a similar type but others were things like uh, club nights and events where people came and fundraised for community groups. Uh, we held a similar one like that in London, which fundraised uh, for Hackney Account, which is one of the organisations that's represented here today by Emmanuel. Um, we also supported people to run really innovative different types of events. People had political education sessions in local barbershops um, as part of the sort of Fuck Boris network. People ran uh, cultural events where instead of buying a ticket to enter, you brought a bag of shopping that was then donated to a local food bank. Uh, so we just tried to grow that network with a range of creative, diverse ways to get people active. Um, at that point, that was around the election. So I just kind of like to, I guess, show our working out and how we did that and how we built that kind of thing. Um, we've heard, as I say, about the need for ongoing work and investment in long term organising. And I think that is completely crucial uh, and it's something that we must keep in mind. So I would encourage people to follow and join organisations, contribute your time. There are so many small campaigning organisations that just having somebody who can check the email account a couple of times a week is a huge contribution that will help their work a great deal. So don't feel like you don't have something to offer. You absolutely do. When it comes to mobilizing, however, or if you want to set up your own kind of organizations, I'd encourage everybody to think about the breadth of people that you know from home, work, from your local area, leisure activities that you're involved in, university or school. What might bring them together in this case on this bill? What are the different interests that those groups that you are, have contact with in your life uh, could bring them in to become part of an alliance that would stand against the bill in your area, in your community? Are there any local organisations that would be affected by this bill or local communities that you know would be particularly aggressively affected as we've heard from Gracie and other speakers about some of the nastiest aspects of the bill? And think broadly, uh, this can be anybody from food banks, faith groups, uh, young children in school, who can be an ally in this fight where you are and get in touch with them. Then it's important to think about what kind of investment and involvement they might have. Would they attend a protest, for example? Would they maybe sign a petition? Um, would they help with coverage in local news outlets so that you can get your voices heard in that way? Would they even just agree to tell five people that they know in their life about the bill and why it's so bad and encourage those people to take action? Another key question is around the political purpose of your action or your protest who or what is it focused on? So we've seen over this week, many protests being focused at Downing Street um, and at the very beginning, the vigil for Sarah Everard in Clapham Common. Um, so think about where it's taking place, what's the kind of target and the aim of it and why it's useful for it to take place there and in that way. What are its top three concerns? Who is it communicating with? Um, and how will you get your message out there? Will you use social media? Will you use press? Will you use creative stunts um, to get across the key kind of concerns you have and the messages from your community about why they want to stand against this bill? It's also useful to think about how you'll measure a job done well. Um, how many people do you want to engage or do you want to come? 
is an important thing to do to build relationships in your community that are ongoing and have a kind of longer burn that means that you can organize with those people over a longer period of time is a measure that you want to include like media coverage or response from power holders do you want your local mp to write back to you about a particular piece of lobbying you're doing on the bill for example so overall, I just wanted to kind of underline that mobilizing in your area is something that you can do and you can start doing it right now. Um, it can look like whatever makes sense where you are to the people in your community with the resources that you have at your disposal, even if that resource is only a little bit of time. Um, if you do feel that you don't know where to start, there are so many organizations who you can contact. Some of the groups that are even in this call this evening, um, I know, for example, that the NetPol website has a huge amount of useful information available um, for people who want to organize protests and set up also police monitoring projects. There's al also organizations like Green and Black Cross who have loads of information about how you keep yourself safe, uh, legally safe at demonstrations and how you can do legal support there. Um, and they do things like legal observer training as well, which is really important. Obviously, the example I'm talking about, Fuck Boris, happened before the pandemic. Um, there was always safety concerns and we made sure that we had first aiders at all of our demonstrations. But it's important to think about health um, at the forefront of anything that you organise at the moment. And I would make sure to look up Queer Care, who have a lot of really, really useful advice and protocols about how you keep people healthy and safe under the current conditions that we're living in. Um, so. That's all I wanted to say, really. Um, we get active both in mobilizing the kind of stuff that I've talked about, bringing people together who have concerns about the bill to show the strength and breadth of our opposition, and also through organizing that long term work, the day to day work of building power with people across political divides in our communities and in our workplaces, so that this movement keeps growing and so that we can defeat this bill. We either win it together across the whole of this country or we don't win um, and if a week of protests mostly in London work to treat just imagine what months of protests across the country could do thanks thank you so much Becca um, yeah it's so helpful to hear how you can actually start a campaign and what you think about because often um, for people who aren't already in the campaign you see the work but you don't know what that goes on in the background so um, in this chat as well, we will share a list of organisations. It's, it's a suggestible document, so you can add to it, and we encourage you to add to it. But there are already a list of organisations who you, I encourage you to like look into, see if they're a good fit for you. Um, even if they're not, like turn up to the first meetings, because you never know until you try sometimes. Um, and then, if not, start your own. There's something else that you're passionate about that no one else is talking about. Start your own for sure. Um, I'm also, just before um, I ask Emmanuel to um, start um, speaking, I also wanted to just let you know that, um, well, I'm very happy to let you know that we're also joined by a representative from Citizen Cut, um, who, as we know, have been leading the fight for in the Kilda Bill campaign. Um, but sisters have been receiving a lot of heat recently, so they're going to keep the video off when they're speaking. Um, but for now, um, over to you, Emmanuel. Um, hello everyone, thank you for having me, Abolitionist Futures. Um, I come from Hackney Account. Hackney Account is a youth-led monitoring group based in Hackney and we focus on scrutinising the police. We recently published our, um, a research paper about policing within Hackney and with when it comes to this bill and when I look at it and how it's caused so much um, pain in local communities, and just not advocate for our voices, as we say. Um, it reminds me of what happened after the Mark Duggins protests when um, Boris Johnson issued out um, the gangs matrix. And it seems to me that whenever there's an issue within the black community or communities or marginalized groups in general, the government pitches out a bill that would just kind of subject us to oppression and harm and violence. And what, when it comes to mobilizing, what I would say to everyone here is that we need to make sure that we understand who we are going behind and who we are supporting. When we look at things like identity and represent representational politics, they don't really advocate for all groups. We see that 
a lot of the times they use public figures that identify as black or BAME and they push them out just to mobilize people behind them and get votes. And we need to move away from things to do with our identity and actually scrutinize the person based on their beliefs, their policies and their views. Um, at Hackney Account, um, the way we've kind of mobilized people is get people behind the community and people that are from the community that actually have lived experience of police brutality and police violence, people from quote unquote the hood or from council estates to be the people at the forefront and that will actually conduct the research. We train people to do the research, we train people to do the rights and we train people about the rights that they have on the police and being stopped on the, um, on the police and so forth. And um, yeah, that's all I've really got to say today. I haven't got much to say. Thanks, um, Emmanuel. It's really, I mean, I live so close to Hackney, so I know how, um, well, how horrible, <laughs> for lack of a better word right now, the police are particularly to um, the mostly black and brown community here. Um, so yeah, you guys are doing an amazing and important work. So thank you for um, sharing that with us today. Um, I'll now pass over to Sister Zanka if you if you're good to go now. I see you on mute. Um, let me just check. Oh, okay. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. You can. Okay, cool. Uh um, yeah, thank you very much uh, for having me on. Really respect um, abolitionist futures work, and I know it's been a really hectic week, but I actually think it's really great that alongside the on the street mobilisations, you've been able to like provide the very important political education alongside it. I feel like that is my personal dream. So thank you so much. It's just kind of happened by accident, but I just think it's really great. Um, so yeah, in terms of mobilization, like I, obviously it's like great to hear that the bill is gonna be delayed. Um, sorry, I'm out on a walk at the moment. So sorry if you can hear lots of background noise. Um, first walk I've had all week. Um, so yeah, like it's great to hear that the bill will be delayed. Um, I actually like a few days, like, well, maybe a couple of days before I asked some like legal people who, like know a lot, like, you know, do you think there's any chance that this mobilize, mobilization can at least get it delayed? Like, I know we're not gonna necessarily kill it like right now, but do you think there's any chance we can get it delayed? And they were like, nah, nah, it's never gonna happen. It's never gonna happen. And I was like, okay, fine, long game, long game. And like, we did like those constant mobilizations over the last week, like has actually shifted something. And I think the reason why people assume that that wouldn't happen is because you know, the Tories have like a massive majority. But I think this week has actually really shown that even with that majority, they really don't know what they're doing. Like, they really don't know what they're doing. Pre Patel fucked herself this week, sorry to swear, but like she really did. And like has been exposed of like throwing the Metropolitan Police under the bus. And so like, actually that's made at least me feel a lot bolder in terms of like what our possibilities are to be quite politically shrewd and actually see that you know, they're flailing and we're getting organized. So like, I think that's one thing that I'm kind of like feeling is, it, I think everyone needs to sort of take home and like feel really proud of, especially everyone that's worked so hard all this week, that's mobilized, that's been out on the streets, that's been organizing things like abolitionist futures sessions. Like this has all been quite critical for that. In terms of like what happens after this, so the, another thing that the person that I spoke to a couple of days ago said is that they thought it wouldn't get delayed, but they thought that what they will end up doing is like basically like changing the bill so that some elements of it like remain and some elements go. And I think that that is actually really highly likely. And I think that that has the potential to really divide and divide and rule essentially that some, you know, this, this bill actually impacts so many different communities. And even though it's like disturbingly authoritarian, it like the fact that Pretty Patel hates all of these people and wants to have in one fell swoop in one bill, something that's just gonna take away the rights of so many different groups. 
also has the kernel of like solidarity in it. So I do think it is extremely important that, you know, they are going to want to divide and rule by giving crumbs to some people. And then I suspect like continuing with the criminalization of black communities and Gypsy Roma Traveller communities. So it is absolutely critical that everyone's being brought together through this, through organizing on this bill, that if that does happen, needs to like stay with it, stay organized, stay organized in solidarity and not like go home once they're the bit that they're most concerned about like has 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 been has been resolved for them um in terms of like what we do now from like you know i think it would be really really um key to spend some time now we have a little bit of a delay um to like get people trained up get people trained up in direct action in organizing um you know sisters like if you were at the meeting yesterday, sent um, had a like form that people filled out, like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people already filled it out from all over the country. And it's going to be really important that people like organize in, you know, their regions, but also feel trained up and also feel connected with each other so that they're like everyone feels supported and part of it, but also can start taking their own action. Um, so, yeah, I feel like that. But that you know that's that's something personally that I think is going to be really important is like keeping in touch with people um keeping them trained up um making yeah like and spend the next like however long we've got with this bill like um prioritizing that um but yeah I definitely feel like you know we can we can definitely definitely win this with um organizing and being kind of politically shrewd like like I said the Tories might have a majority, but they they're not they're not as strong as maybe we think they are. Like, you know, th this week is just, they're all over the place. And I feel like we need to learn how to exploit that. We need to be politically shrewder, uh, exploiting their weaknesses like they try to with us. And we've got to outmaneuver them. Um, and that means solidarity. That means like being clued up. Um, and that means like looking for opportunities. So, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. I hope that was helpful. It was. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, because sometimes all you feel is despair. So it's really energizing to hear about work that's gone on and the direct impact that it's had so quickly. And um, yeah, and on the divide and rule, like as I men mentioned on um, on Wednesday's talk, I think it was about like the crumbs that they gave previously that ruined movements before. And then Nim yesterday talked about um, like the hate crime um, stuff that's coming through and how that might end up fracturing our movement. So uh, yeah, I think it's so important for us to keep learning from each other, as you said. Um, now that we've got a bit of time and continue applying that pressure, um, making sure that we're not we're not taking the smallest of wins um, when that will end up being really detrimental to other communities. So we're actually um, well ahead of time, um, despite that technical issue in the beginning. So thank you to our speakers for keeping it short and sweet, which hopefully means um, that we can answer loads of questions. Um, for If you do have questions, i uh, just remind you to please use your Q&A box to add the questions in, and we'll hopefully be able to get to them. Um, but just to begin, I'm going to open up with some um, kind of discussion points. Um, please feel free to offer our panelists to jump in. Um, I'm not going to be going around in order unless we get complete silence and then I might have to unfortunately pick on you, which I hate doing. So, um, But also do feel free if you, if you feel like one of the questions are not really something that you're speaking about to pass as well. So my first question is, there's been a lot of talk um, today, but over the last uh, couple of days about movement building. How do we go from mobilizing, which I feel like we're doing now, to getting to the stage where we're actually organizing and then getting to the point where we are movement building as well? Go ahead, Kevin. I think some of this has been touched on already, but the, the crucial thing I think is that it has to start from, from the communities where we work, where we're based. Um, I mean, people know what they what what's happening to on the ground where they live. That's that tends to be the reality. Um, and in terms of the 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 approach to be able to mobilising around the bill, that's part of it. But part in in the longer term, because we are talking about building a movement that uh, that is looking to challenge the role of police in society. Um, that is going to be 
the particular issues that may be happening in Nottingham or Bristol or Manchester or wherever it might be. So, um, and it's practical stuff. The way, the way that movements are built is by providing some degree of support to people who need it, right? Providing that solidarity on the ground. Um, there's a there's a new group that's been set up in Bristol, Bristol Cop Watch, which is basically just doing, uh, helping, just helping people to deal with uh, making complaints uh, about either police violence or, or you know, misuse of stop and search powers. And you know, it's exhausting work, but it's really important um, because quite often the the ability to be able to mobilise people behind an issue and turn that into a campaign is going to come from the networks of people who know each other, frankly. The pe people who can, like, we talked about this, Manuel mentioned this, the people in Hackney know what the policing of people in Hackney is like. like. The people in Newham, where I live, know exactly what the policing of Newham is like. Um, young people know way more about the policing of stop and search than I'm ever going to be, going to be able, experiencing now. Um, and so I, I guess that's the starting point. You need We need to start mobilizing locally so there, there are lots of national campaign I'm, you know, I'm speaking on behalf of a national campaigning group but local organizing is absolutely key i think i mean it always has been the way that movements have been built from the bottom up thanks kevin does anyone want to jump in i would just say to anybody that's um this is maybe like a bit of a geeky answer to this question but to anybody who is interested in that distinction and like what deep organizing that goes beyond just people who might already agree or sympathize with our position. Um, I would recommend that you read the work of Jane McAlevey or like look up on YouTube any of the talks that she's done because she's very clear about how those two types of political work are not necessarily the same, but also the way in which when you start to organize with people particularly in like a workplace or where you live, um, you can see through the level of engagement of everybody who is involved in your project or in your organization, if they're engaged, if they're signing, for example, every single petition that you put out is signed by 100% of people in your project or in your organization, that shows you that you have serious buy-in from people. And then you can start to escalate the kind of um, involvement that they have and when you escalate the involvement that they have it means you have more and more power so she has quite helpful kind of equations really for thinking about how you build power through that depth of organizing and oftentimes it's hard and it's like harder than mobilizing with people that we know and like and agree with but it's really necessary work if we're going to be able to counter as Gracie said at the beginning a government with this kind of majority mm. Yeah, for sure. And um, starting even with, like I said, like people, you know, your friends and families who are living where you're living. So they're experiencing these things, um, even if maybe they haven't, obviously you're coming to talks like this, even if they haven't developed that language yet, I think it's helpful to talk through the experiences. That's how I've done it with my family <laughs> anyway. And it, it helps and you don't realise just how much of a shared experience you have until you start talking to people about it. Um, Dara, I'd love to actually ask you, um, maybe quite selfishly, because I'm really interested in this, how did you get from yourself being an educator yourself and then make that jump to starting up and like working within something like No More Exclusions? Because you've done it, you've done the going from mobilising to now organising. Yeah, hi, Jira. Um, I suppose going through the process of exclusion myself, um, thanks to the marketization of education, I found myself without a job, uh, you know, after restriction and redundancy. And, um, and that was both good and bad. The bad thing was that I, <laughs> I was without a job and I really love my job. Um, I love teaching, I love being in the classroom and I, and I really miss it. Um, but then <sighs> not being in the job, I suppose, freed me to speak for the first time in 20 years. I was able to say things without worrying about what the employer would do uh, or say about my views. And, um, and I haven't looked back. So I'm not ready to give up education anytime soon. Um, 
I'm just I, I'm just taking it. I hate us out of the classroom. I plan to go back one day, um, but there's so much work that has to be done at systemic level, mm-hmm. and I really feel that having you know that that experience both in mainstream as a teacher of color and then at the people referral unit you know there are there are some unique insights that i think are, have to be mainstreamed that a lot of people don't know that what goes on in these units a lot of people don't know you know what the daily realities are and the struggles the trauma you know the, the lived experience that comes there and I, and I think yeah i mean it's not i wouldn't I, the, the term activist is very uncomfortable. I'm an educator. Wherever I go, that's what I do. And, 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 and I'm a learner as well. You know, I'm learning from people around me and my students and the children and young people and the elders. Like enemy is multi-generational. We've got young people, we've got people in their 20s, 30s, and we've got, you know, and everybody's, everybody's got aunties and uncles, you know, in our movement that you can go for for different things, whether it's legal stuff, psychological, whether it's healing, whether there's strife, mutual aid, you know, it's a huge collective of expertise. And this is a beautiful thing to, to be able to fall in love with education again, because it became, to, particularly towards the end of my career, it became obvious that I didn't fit in. And so many of us don't fit in. Our faces don't fit, our views don't fit, uh, our, our resistance to oppression doesn't fit, uh, our refusal to enact policies like prevent, doesn't fit, restraint doesn't fit, detention doesn't fit. So what do you do? Do you continue to struggle on the inside, although that is necessary, or from, you know, you step out? And in my case, I was forced to step out, but looking back, it was it was probably the best thing for me. Yeah. Gosh, it's, it's funny how things work out, right? Like, yeah. yeah, no coincidences. Yeah. Um, Emmanuel or sisters, I don't know if you wanted to jump in on this question. Sorry, what exactly was the question again? Um, let me get it out so I'm not messing up the writing. Um, so yeah, um, so there have been a lot of talks about movement building, um, but I guess the question is how do we go from mobilising, which I feel like many of us are at now, the stage of mobilising, getting people involved, to then go on to organizing and movement building? Yeah, so in terms of making it more sustainable movement, I will say education needs to be at the core of the movement and organizing. Normally when we see things happening, like the what happened in BLM and right now, is that people um, collectively mobilize based on outrage that is currently now in the present. However, it's more it's important that we look at the more systemic issues and that can only happen when you look at the history of this country and the issues that we've had with policing and knowing that policing is, it's never really been there to protect and serve and that policing has always failed and the criminal justice system has always been failing, not just now, but in in the past as well. So it's important that education is at the forefront of what we're doing and that we keep advocating based on theory and theory and and public um, kind of mobilizing is works hand in hand and yeah yeah exactly um so i don't know if you wanted to jump in or you happy for me to move on i think maybe here another question okay cool so um i guess really literally following on from that is We have a lot of people's attentions right now. How do we make sure we don't lose people's attention? Um, Obviously around the bill as well, because it might come back months later. But just in general, how do we keep people who are interested in the bill and kind of spread it out to other things um, that are just as impactful and just as important? Um, I think that we need to get better at staying in touch with people um, and making them feel like they are really part of something. Um, I've been involved in movements for quite like quite a while now and like my natural kind of like way of organizing is sometimes just to sort of like you know drift in and out and like out of a group or like you know and feel like that's okay for everyone else. Um, which can be really like great in many ways and give you freedom to just like 
do what you need to do but it also has serious limitations when you're trying to like build a movement and yeah I think you know I definitely feel like need to like there needs to be some reflection on what the limitations of our movement so far have been like how we can change that like how we can stay in touch with people so that they actually feel like a member of a movement that's not necessarily something they drop by at, like and then you know go away for six months and come back and kind of don't necessarily feel part of it or you know don't really feel like they're part of a community as well like I do actually think that you know organizing spaces shouldn't just be like dry organizing spaces they should feel like community they should feel like fun they should feel like places where people want to be like sometimes they've got to do you know you've got to do the like difficult conversations but you should also be like spending time with each other getting to know each other um and I think that element and yeah going back and staying in touch with people what asking people what they need to be part of this movement like what are they confident at what they're not confident at how can we address the things that they feel like they need to be a proper part of the movement I feel like that element you know maybe the left has not been so good at over the last few years and is going to need to get a lot better at um to keep people's attention and make them feel part of something when it's not in the news yeah definitely um and i know becky you actually touched upon this um briefly you were talking about doing funding as well like club nights and stuff like that which gets people coming together i don't know if you wanted to expand on that a bit more yeah, certainly. I mean, look, in a pandemic context, it's a little bit different. When we were doing this in 2019, the idea was that we were producing like street festivals, carnivals, and then when it expanded across the country, yeah, it was a lot of club nights, social events, you know, things like I mentioned, like um, kind of hangouts in barbershops where people did political education. Um, the current context, I don't know, you know, I don't know if that kind of engagement will be possible, that kind of spending time together will be possible. Obviously there's ways that we can innovate to do that online, but I certainly think uh, a lot of what uh, Kevin said about meeting people regarding their needs, um, and Sister spoke about it as well, in terms of like, the things that are urgent in people's minds are the things that are directly connected to their material needs. Um, and when we, are only working on things which are completely dislocated from people's basic material needs. It means that often people are only going to be able to engage in that kind of like cyclical level. And that is not necessarily bad in terms of like when we have big mobilizations and flashpoints, of course, there's going to be more people who join at those particular moments. Um, and that shouldn't necessarily be seen as a bad thing. But I think being able to develop a broader kind of base does involve thinking about well what sort of material needs are we engaged in what sort of um, things that people consider urgent in our community are we actually addressing in our work um, and I think also I mean I guess part of what I was trying to put across by talking about the way in which demos are something which are really anybody can put on you don't need to have a specific set of skills is that like people feel invested in things that they have power over and particular particularly when like all of us are so aggressively disempowered in our day-to-day -day life that if movements are able to involve people develop people's power you know give people power share power with other people and develop kind of collective power together this can also be something which i think keeps people invested um, over a longer period because that's where you're seeing that you're having a kind of impact and power in your life and in your community. Yeah, definitely. Um, I don't know, anyone else? Yeah, uh, Kevin. Yeah, just to add to that really, I mean, um, the, the idea that, that you make yourself useful within the, commu within the community is actually not um, anything other than people responding to their own needs quite often. So I talk about the idea of, of a, of a survival program, but I mean, the best projects that have been have done work around, um, say, the issue of oppressive policing, have been ones where they've their people have come together because it's their own direct experience, and they need something to they need to do something about it. Or in some cases, it's been the mothers of children who have been affected by oppressive policing coming together to say, "I'm not prepared to put up with this treatment. My 
of my kids anymore. And certainly that's been been some of my experience going back over what 30 years of doing some of this, doing this work at a local level. Um, one of the the interesting things I think that we that is going to get explored at some point is that kind of big burst of mutual aid groups that sprung up um, kind of in in April, March and April last year. Um, and some of those were incredibly successful. They're just addressing what needed to be done on the ground. And some of them utterly failed. And part of the reason why they failed was because, um, well, in many cases, because there wasn't an agreement about what it was that they were trying to achieve, that many of them were just plain and simple co-opted by by the by people within the local with it with power particularly within local councils and the ability to avoid being pushed into um, a position where you are essentially just um, a, a token response to a, 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 to a particular problem that um, oh yeah we're supporting that group and that's fine or that you get somebody that the council just decides that he wants to push you in a, in a completely reformist direction are all considerations that other people have been through before you know it's not it's not like we have to keep on reinventing the wheel there are people that have uh, had this experience in the past um, but I do also think that the the starting point for for mobilizing has come because people not necessarily have a just a shared set of ideas but but kind of know each other anyway, right? I mean, if I before doing this job the, the, uh, for Netpol, I spent 12 years working in a community centre right, in Forest Gate in East London, and that was brilliant as a political as a political education. That was fantastic because you got to know everybody, absolutely everybody from every conceivable group, um, and it meant it meant that whenever we did need to mobilise about anything, you didn't have to build the structures from from scratch to get hold of people. You knew where people uh, were. You knew the groups that were doing um, work that are likely to be sympathetic. And I think those that kind of starting point, which is really really basic, is incredibly important for when the big when the moment comes when there's something you have to get everybody together for, um, not having to do that completely from scratch. And the, the last thing is, is that when we do this, is not losing all that, that knowledge and skills, not letting it all kind of drift off because a, a campaign has, has finished. That's something we're incredibly bad at, of not hanging on to that, to the kind of the store of knowledge that's been that's been brought together. Um, I don't have an answer to that, I'm afraid, but, um, but I do think it's something we need to be better at and we need to be better at it. We need to st st stop keeping making that mistake all the time. Which is difficult to do. Um, but I guess that's part of the building. Does anyone else want to ask this question as well? Okay, I don't see anyone unmuting, so I'm going to move on to the next question, um, which kind of edges us in a different direction slightly. So, um, actually, before I read out that question, there was a question in the chat, and I don't know if anyone knows this, and it might be that. No one knows, and that's okay as well. Someone asked, um, there seems to be um, some confusion around the develop, devolved nations as to whether this bill will affect them or not. Is there any confirmation of how this bill is going to work across the UK? Does the whole bill only affect England and Wales, or also Scotland and Northern Ireland? Does anyone know? It might be that we don't know, and we can answer it later. There are some, some differences in the protest uh, regulations for Scotland. Um, and obviously everything to do with public order, policing, the courts and sentencing for, for the six counties is always completely different. So um, I, I don't know enough detail, but I'm, I'm fairly certain that a number of the particular regulations around, for instance, um, serious annoyance uh, and serious unease that may be caused by my protest aren't, don't apply to Scotland. Interesting to know. Um, cool, I hope that answers that question. Um, okay, so my next question is, um, so people obviously understand the response to things that they can see, um, and that's what we've seen um, with these protests. Like I think there's been, a, there's been like a bill and there's been some very specific things that people are getting angry about, like not being able to protest being the main thing. Um, but how do we support 
people to feel just as angry and get mobilized about things that maybe they don't see. Um, examples being longer sentences or sort of social confinement or indefinite detention. I'm happy to chip in a little bit on that one. Um, I, I do think it's, you know, it's understandable why particular elements of this bill have been the ones that have gained the most amount of public attention and have been the kind of core points of mobilising. Um, it is also a huge bill with a massive amount of stuff jumbled in there. But this, a lot of the sentencing stuff that is in there uh, around prisons and prisoners is incredibly draconian and aggressive. You know, we, as Gracie said at the beginning, have the largest um, per capita number of people in prison, England and Wales does, in the whole of Western Europe. And that number is set to rise. We currently have around, hovering around 80,000 people in prison. Those people have been in de facto solitary confinement for over a year at this point because of the lockdown conditions that have happened in our prisons. Uh, this means no visitation, no contact with family, with children, with loved ones. Um, and the government are quite openly saying that as a result of the 20,000 new police officers that they're going to hire, they expect the number of prisoners to rise to over 100,000 people in the next five to six years. So we are already have a hugely bloated prison system and many, many tens of thousands of people from our communities are hidden away um, and cut off from freedom and from daily life and from contact with their loved ones. And that number is only set to rise. The government are very kind of hell bent on rising that number actually and prison expansion programs. Um, in terms of how we continue to make that visible and urgent to people, I would encourage people to get in contact with local organizations and grassroots organizations that do work and contact people in prison, organizations like Bent Bars, um, who do like pen pal service for um, LGBTQ prisoners. Uh, there is a new um, end solitary confinement campaign that's being developed at the moment that will launch soon. Um, organizations like the Prisoner Solidarity Network. If you get involved with, you know, even just writing a letter once every few weeks to somebody who is in prison, this will enable us to keep those connections across prison walls. Um, and the more that we are able to kind of connect with the stories of people both inside and those whose loved ones are inside, who are on the outside and deeply impacted by that kind of mass imprisonment. Um, I think that where we can, we should be emphasizing that these people's human rights are being violated uh, consistently now for a year and that our prison system is in a completely sorry state. And that those elements of the bill um, should not be going through either because it's going to we've our prisons have been in crisis according to successive governments and media for about 20 years uh and this is not going to help that ongoing crisis it's only going to make it worse so i do think we have to try and stay cognizant of it as much as possible and i would encourage everybody to just keep in contact with these those issues if you don't have contact already so that you can see the i guess like human element of what that means for people as well um I wanted to come in on that. Um, so I actually think that like this week's mobilization in many ways is a really good example of people kind of organizing somewhat on something that they can't see because like this bill, you know, it's not law yet. The police don't yet have the powers that are proposed, but people have made the connections between the police behavior um, over the weekend at Clapham Common towards women with the possibility that of the police having even more powers and it getting worse. So I do think part of it is like, you know, people can obviously feel that and sense that, like it's not happened yet, but they can sense like the dread of what that would mean if, if that were to come to pass. So I think we definitely need to be doing more to connect the dots um, between like different struggles. Um, and yeah, I definitely think part of that means like organizing with people who are impacted um, people organizing with people that are organizing around prisons who are incarcerated or formerly incarcerated um, or detainees and I also think it personally I think it also means like I don't know I, I, I think that we have sometimes got a little bit of a aversion um, on the left of like comparing different people's struggles and making and 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 having this sense that no one's 
experiences are, are reducible or comparable to someone else's um, experiences. And I think that can make it quite difficult to then link with people and see that sometimes your experience is not maybe not the same as someone else's or someone from a different community, but there are, you know, maybe links that can help you see where someone else is coming from or see what they've experienced. And I think, you know, we need to actually be doing a, a little bit, um, a little bit more of that because, you know, like when we're talking about like abolition, I feel like we really need to do a lot more work to broaden our analysis and our organizing around what that means and what um, surveillance means in people's lives. And, you know, a lot of people will not see the things that are happening in their life through an abolitionist framework or, or connect it in any way or see the way that they're surveilled as being connected to an abolitionist movement. You know, when social services are surveilling you and like your children, how many people would necessarily see that as connected to the police or connected to prisons or connected to detention? You know, but they are connected. They're completely connected. But there's a, you know, a sort of failure to necessarily do the analysis and the organizing that connects those dots. So like, it seems invisible. And I think actually this week, you know, Pri Patel was probably really surprised that like the police response um, to on Saturday led to being connected to the bill. She probably never thought that was going to happen in a million years. Yeah, she she obviously ordered what happened on Saturday and never thought in a million years that we would make the connection between police disbanding a vigil and trying to stop um, and to stop this bill. So like, you know, and actually people have massively shifted on that over this week. People, you know, who didn't know about that bill now do and are connecting it. And then in, in real terms, in, in terms of like what that's going to mean for their life if it does come in. So like, yeah, I feel like actually this week has been a really good example where maybe people are connecting the dots they are seeing that something that is currently not law what impact that will have on their lives and hopefully are seeing what it, impact it will have on other people's lives that maybe aren't them or aren't from their community so yeah I personally feel like connecting the dots connecting the dots in terms of like what we mean by surveillance prisons policing all of those things what that looks like in people's lives and having a sharper analysis and bringing that to our organizing. Definitely, and you're right, we've, we've seen how, when you get people going, it doesn't matter if they just, it's just a bill, they don't really know what that means, they can still get people going, and this week has been proof of that. Um, did, did anyone else want to come in on that question? Okay, if not, um, I'll end on the last question we're coming to the end, I don't wanna, keep anyone back on a Friday evening. Um, so for my last question, in the last year, abolition and abolition thinking and conversation has really grown here in the UK. Um, so what does your abolitionist future look like? Um, and I'll start with Emmanuel. Um, to me, when I think of um, abolition and what it looks like to me, it means reimagining justice, reimagining a system that speaks for all and advocates for all and not just puts equality at the forefront but equity at the forefront as well and oftentimes when we look at abolitionist movements and stuff like that it comes from a space where people necessarily didn't know it was going to happen for example the Haitian um, revolution that kind of came out of not nowhere but it came out as a shock to I'll say to the um, colonial powers that had um power over that um, nation. So it's always a space for abolition in society. So I would say for abolition to me, what it looks like is a system that advocates for all and which is based around love and care and actually addressing the root causes that people um, face. And it's not the castle system that we have today, not a police state that is being formed through the bill that we have currently now. And it's, just a system that is built on love and understanding that the people that we see within the criminal justice system, when it comes to policing, when it comes to stop and searches, when it comes to prisons and inmates and, and so forth, so even, even rapists, they don't just come out of nowhere. Like they come from an area where society has failed and where people have not met the needs 
of these people. So it's it's basically based upon love and and care, I would say. And yeah. I love that. That's that's the kind of world I want to live in for sure. Um, does anyone else want to ask answer this question? Um, what does abolitionist future look like for you? Oh, go ahead, Kevin. Um, I, I think the, the simple answer is how can, we don't know. Um, I mean, we start from, uh, many of us start from, 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 uh, from a position of, of not thinking that we have all the answers to that question <laughs> because it, it's so complex. And also because, let's face it, that I think we also need to be honest with ourselves that as a movement, abolitionism is in its infancy in this country. Um, and we are, we've got an awful long way to go to be able to build something that actually represents a genuine movement. Um, so to go back to something I said right at the beginning, I think many of the ideas that we develop will be tested by organising. They will be tested by just going out and doing it. Um, there isn't a roadmap to, um, to, to, to the place we want to get to. There's just the kind of energy to try and, and get started and get doing it. So, and that's what I said I, before, I, you know, at some point we're going to have to just go out and get our hands dirty. We're going to have to start doing that work ourselves um, because otherwise we're just going to end up talking about what's happening in the States and, 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 and not really finding out how much that will actually work here. Exactly. And like everyone here on the panel um, has been doing that work and I hope this, um, this whole thing has inspired more people to jump in as well. Um, anyone else want to go? Um, yeah, I think my idea of abolition um, means like the end, end to capitalism. Like, I do not see any possibility, realistically, of ending prisons, ending surveillance in our lives, ending policing without also ending capitalism and basically having to start from scratch in terms of like what everyone said, meeting our needs, meeting our housing needs, meeting our, you know, childcare needs, meeting our education needs without a capitalist system. Um, so that, you know, that is massive, but I genuinely don't think the likelihood that we can end those systems of surveillance, policing, prisons, all of that is likely to happen unless we confront that that which is a reality as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Great, thank you. I've heard from almost everyone. So I don't know, Becca or Zahra, if you wanted to jump in. Adira, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. I was just thinking, um, what does it look like? Uh, I think it's a total transformation of the self um, first. I don't think we talk about that enough. There's a lot about uh, tear this down, tear that structure down, change this. But what work, you know, on the self is being done? I'm interested in that as an educator. And, uh, and also I'm interested in abolition as an the understanding that is not, it's both rapid response and long-term strategies. We need both. Um, and, you know, but to make the movement irresistible, I think. I don't think it's about, you know, to quote Angela Davis, I don't think it's about making it more palatable, um, you know, taking it to places that makes people feel comfortable, using language that is more comfortable. Um, I think we have to stick with um, all the time learning about it. So I, think, I don't think anyone here is claiming to be an abolitionist expert. You know, it's, it's a life, life, lifelong journey for all of us. There, there is a cop in each of us. There's a cop in Kevin, there's one in Becca, there's one in me, there's one in Yuhajira, there's cops everywhere. So we got to start with the cop within. Uh, look at the cops in our families, grandpa cop, granddad cop, teacher cop, auntie cop, work with those and, 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 and work outwards for me. Um, and going back to care, really important to have an idea of how we're going to sustain it make it irresistible, build something that we can then pass on as well. Thank you. I love that, copying everyone. Um, and Becca, I'm not going to push you if you don't want to. Yeah, I don't have a great deal to say. I think abolitionist 
future to me looks like one where people are not held in cages as a response to harm um, or as a response oftentimes not you know to unmet need rather than any kind of causing of harm to be honest um, but that we don't hold people in cages as a response to anything um, and I agree mostly with what sister said I think that abolition really looks like communism and freedom to be honest that's the dream. Um, so yeah, thank you so much to all our panelists, organizers, and of course, everyone who's listening today on their Friday night. Um, I know we're all tired and this the energy of today has been quite like, just relaxed and just, it was just really nice to hear everyone um, speaking and learn from everyone. Um, I know we've drummed this in so many times, but I really, really urge everyone to um, have a look at the documents that we've shared, get involved, this can't be the end. Um, and we really hope it's not. Um, and yeah, I guess that's everything I was going to say. Oh, I was going to also say that um, Abolition Futures, we are going to be having more webinars like this in the future, so please do keep a lookout for them. And we also have a book club next week um, on Mutual Aid by Dean Spade. So if you're interested in that, please um, check out the website, which also has a ton of other resources um, on abolition, on a lot of these topics that we've talked about. Um, so yeah, I hope to see you there. I hope everyone gets involved and keeps on learning. So yeah, on that note, I think we'll end there. Thank you again and have a lovely weekend, everyone. Bye.